Thank you, Professor Sudman, for, for being with us uh, and for having this talk on computational thermodynamics and open culture. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Fabio, for the invitation to come here. It's been a very nice time and, and uh, I learned more things also. Um, my talk will be more, much more theoretical than the previous one. I have never really done experiments scientifically. <laughs> I worked in a steel company for uh, half a year and that get, learned a lot of practical things. But uh, Otherwise, uh, I will mainly talk about dynamics, which is uh, a favorite hate topic between uh, students. Also deal with how you can construct uh, software for calculating using dynamics and also how one can develop databases because that is the key part of um, computational dynamics. Without a database, you cannot do anything. And the databases are based on experience and theory. And um, that's where you have the data for doing predictions and simulations. And I will finish with some small cases of simulations. Well, materials um, are very wide. You can deal with jet engines or, or swords, or you can build dams for water. And you all times you need materials which can perform as you want. With some dynamics, one can make some more predictions about uh, how things are done before you actually do it. And then uh, you can avoid certain troubles uh, with uh, that things break down or, or doesn't perform as you expect. And uh, with dynamics, we basically deal with temperature, pressure and the composition, but also with the different types of phases which can occur in materials. And uh, these can also then be used for simulation of phase transformation, like the bainite, uh, which was in the previous lecture. And part of the modeling and the databases we are working with contain properties of different phases. So these are microstructures, which are a bit more simple than the previous ones. The left one is a copper oxygen phase diagram where you see a copper oxide dendrite in a eutectic. In the middle picture, you have a soft annealed steel. And in the right hand diagram is a uh, steel which has been hardened. Uh, well, it's not a very good hardening because you have a bane. You have a pro eutectide um, ferrite formed, you have a perlite formed, and you have a martensitic structure slightly annealed in the middle here. And one can see the old orsonitic grain, as was explained in the previous lecture. and, and um, what is also interesting here is uh, steels has a property of being able to being both very soft so you can form things and it can be hardened after you have formed it it can be hardened and, and that means it will remain in the in the same force as you have done um, with the forming here and, and that is a quite practical feature of, of steels. There are other things which are problematic with steels because it's it's uh, easily corroded and, and um, you have uh, it's quite heavy relative to other materials. But uh, anyway, steel is probably one of the most used ma materials. Well, metallic materials certainly the most used. And Somnamics is a basic tool which we use for, for these predictions. Well, Somnamics is a universal uh, science. Uh, it applies everywhere, more or less. And it applies for all elements in the periodic chart. So one can combine all these uh, elements in order to produce the material one is interested in. And when you deal with start with dynamics you, you learn that you have a system and you have surroundings which are you don't bother about except that they provide um, what you can control inside the system 
And between the system and the surroundings, you have a wall, and the wall can have different properties. And uh, the wall determine the interaction between the system you're interested in and, and the surroundings. And you start with having a wall which is completely isolating the system from the surroundings. So it, inside this system, you will have a constant energy, constant volume, and constant amount of materials. Well, when you learn thermodynamics first time, you basically have a unary material, a uh, single element, and then it's much simpler. But if you deal with a real system, you will have lots of different elements inside your system, and they have different amounts, and uh, you may have difficulties. Uh, they can form different types of phases and, and uh, so on. But inside the system at equilibrium, you will have a constant energy and you will have the uniform temperature, pressure and chemical potentials of all the elements. And this uniform temperature means that the entropy system will be at the maximum. That, that's the first and second law. That's basically all you start with in describing thermodynamics. Then the wall can have different properties. Well, I already said that we can have different phases. So even if you have a uniform chemical potential in the system, you can have various uh, composition on the different phases inside the system. The first thing one can deal with is, is allow heat to be transferred between the surroundings and, and the system. But if you keep the volume constant and this amount of different elements constant, you will have a Helmholtz energy which is minimum at equilibrium. You still will have the entropy calculated from, from this, but um, and the chemical potentials. Then you can also allow the volume to change, so you have the same pressure as the surroundings. And then it is the Gibbs energy, which will be the minimum in the system. And the Gibbs energy is the most, um, basically the, function which are used for the modeling of materials properties. We can also vary the amount of elements inside your system, and then you need to keep the, for example, the volume constant, because you, if you, well, you need to keep one thing constant to separate it from the surroundings. And the minimizing the grand potential is what you deal with to understand what you have for equilibrium inside your system. If you allow also the volume to change, it means you have the Gibbs to him relation. You have exactly the same properties inside your system as you have in the surroundings. So you cannot really do predict anything for your system. But you can allow the volume to change and uh, have some elements which transfer from the through the wall from the surroundings. You, and this is the way you control the system. You, you can specify your temperature, your volume or pressure, and amount of components or chemical potentials of the components. So those are the type of conditions you set in order to understand what is the equilibrium in, in the system. So that's basically all for the thermodynamics. Then you can let use this to obtain a number of interesting properties of the system and how to control them. Of course, you, this is all controlled by partial derivatives. So you, the entropy is the Gibbs. Uh, when you control the pressure and the amount of the system, the negative of the Gibbs energy with respect to temperature is the entropy. The volume is the pressure derivative. Chemical potential is the amount when you divide by the amounts. And it's always important to check what you have for conditions kept fixed, because uh, heat capacity will not be the same if you can control the activity of a component. So those things are, are basically uh, important for your understanding. Then, uh, in order to model the system, the first thing is that you separate each phase. 
So each phase in the system, solid, different solid phases, you have gas phases, you have the liquid phase. You have a model for that, and then you have a different amount of the phases. And the summing up all of that for the stable phases will be give you the Gibbs energy for the system. And if you have many components, uh, this can be a bit complex. And uh, lots of the properties you can predict from this is actually for metastable states. And uh, in order to develop databases where you can combine many properties of many elements, you have to define uh, also properties for the pure elements in metastable states. And that was inside the CALFAD community that is known as a lattice stability. And they were introduced by, by Larry Kaufman in a book in 1970s. And to understand the lattice stability, one can take a phase diagram like this simple for chromium nickel. You have pure chromium here, which is BCC at all temperatures up to the melting. And you have nickel on this side, which is FCC up to the melting temperature. But in order to calculate this uh, equilibrium between the liquid and the BCC or FCC, and also in the solid state, you need to have a pro predict properties of pure chromium as FCC. And that is not, uh, uh, you can never measure it. You have to establish the value for that one. And then you can do this kind of extrapolation of the liquidus solidus for the BCC phase, assuming that nickel is actually BCC, which is, has never appeared. And that is related to the Gibbs energy curves for the different phases. So I have calculated here Gibbs energy curves at 1500 Kelvin, which is just below the eutectic temperature here. And you have a Gibbs energy curve for the BCC, and this is the stable phase for chromium side. But on this side, it will be FCC, which is stable, but you still have need an end point of this BCC curve. And you have an FCC phase for nickel, which is stable on this side, but you need to predict uh, in your modeling a value for the FCC chromium phase. And here you can see that uh, at 1500, chromium FCC should actually be liquid. But of course, you can never measure, obtain that in an experiment. So those lattice stabilities were established by, by Larry Kaufman in the 1970s. And they are just normally linear temperature dependent functions, and those are related to an enthalpy of melting and an entropy of melting. And you can actually, uh, in this case, uh, estimate those values from the stable phase diagram. And use, introducing these lattice stabilities was basically the be beginning of the CALFAD method. They have been uh, questioned several times, but so far, uh, smaller modifications has been made, but uh, not really any total breakdown of the theorem here. Uh, but one thing which is uh, using such linear temperature functions for the lattice stabilities means that you assume that the properties of the different phases for a pure element have, have the same heat capacity. And, and that is, works quite well for most elements, but it doesn't work for iron. Iron has a BCC, iron has a BCC transformation, magnetic transformation in the BCC phase, but there is no, well, there is no magnetic transition in FCC except at very low temperature, around 70 Kelvin. And uh, basic CALFAD, has only dealt with properties above 300 Kelvin, because that's where you have some kinetic um, transformation, uh, control transformations. Above, um, 
below 300 Kelvin, there has been no, no um, interest in, in CALFA techniques until recently when you pe people started doing ab initio calculations. What was done in 1991 with the STT, the UNI database, was adding heat capacity data to the lattice stabilities. But that ex included also a magnetic model. So one separated out the contribution from the magnetic ferromagnetic transition in an empiric model, which depended on the Curie temperature and the Bohr magnetic numbers. So this is uh, pure aluminium in the current urinary database from STTE. Sorry. Uh, in order to avoid that the FCC phase, the heat capacity of FCC increases quite drastically before the melting. And in order to avoid that BCC, FCC aluminium became stable again at high temperature, one introduced a break point at the melting temperature. So the heat capacity of FCC aluminium became the same as the liquid and the same for the liquid at low temperature approaches the FCC heat capacity. In the new urinary database, which is going being developed right now, there's two big changes. One is that one includes in heat capacity data down to zero Kelvin. So here one should have zero heat capacity. If you extrapolate the current urinary to low temperature, you will normally find negative heat capacities, which is not physically realistic. And to avoid the breakpoint at the melting temperature, one introduces a modeling criterion that a solid phase with higher entropy than the liquid must not become stable. So that is a kind of theoretical um, uh, limit on the stability of the solid phases. Okay, so that is a pure element part, which is uh, basic. Uh, part of the Calfad method. Then you go to mixing and then you have of course the entropy of mixing, which is in a simple phase with just uh, random mixing in, in the same set of sites. There has been the development of modeling for crystalline phases where you can include description on the different sublattices. So you take in this case, with the compound energy formulas, we will assume random mixing on each sublattice separately. And that works very well for intermetallic phases and for long range ordering. It doesn't include short range ordering. To do short range ordering, one need to have modeling with clusters, but that uh, is usually too heavy for the current uh, modeling with multi-component systems. You can do it for two or three elements, but for higher ordering systems, it's too heavy computationally. So to go to description of real systems, the current CALFAD modeling include um, excess function for the ferromagnetic transition. One uses uh, long, and long range ordering for intermetallic phases. And one uses simple polynomial expressions in the composition and temperature for uh, Gibbs energy, excess Gibbs energy. So those are what is contains in the databases of, of a CALFAD model. And they are parameters in those uh, databases are fitted to experimental data and also to what you have exp um, theoretically uh, can assume for a phase. And my interest in this is to develop database uh, software. So one has to uh, rec record the Gibbs energy expression for the different phases. And, and with the data structure like this, one can uh, describe the polynomial expression quite well. And then you can add a magnetic contribution and then one can add a configurational entropy compression. So this is the basic uh, expression describing the different phases in the system. And then to calculate the equilibrium, 
all software I know use Lagrangian multiplier method to handle uh, constraints on the um, amounts. This is a prescribed amount of an element and this is what you calculate for during a minimization. And this is the, again the amount of the phase. This is the Gibbsian of phase. This is uh, the constraint on if you have sublattices that the sum of fractions should be unity. And when you calculate diagrams, um, or you normally need to know, be able to change the set of stable phases during the minimization, because you may start with the guess of phases stable, but your guess may be not so good. So if the amount of a phase here becomes negative, it means this phase actually shouldn't be stable. And if the driving force for this phase becomes positive, it means that this phase should be included in, in your minimization for the system. So that is automatically taken care of by, by the algorithm. And the chemical potential here is actually, uh, this is a Lagrangian multiplier. But it actually turns out to be the chemical potential of the system. So that also comes out naturally from the minimization. Uh, so, with this Lagrangian multiplier, you basically have a way of determining uh, the composition of individual phases and the amounts of individual phases by, by just uh, prescribing that uh, your differential for the Lagrangian multiplier should be zero. And that means all the partial derivatives for the Lagrangian should also be zero. But if you do it straight away, it means you have a nonlinear system of equations. And in each equation, you have to solve this minimized, this system of equations, which can be quite heavy and, and not so stable. So my professor in this, uh, teaching this, what's Matt Sillet at KTH, devised the method where you could expand your derivative of the Gibbs energy respect to composition in a Taylor series, and from this Taylor series, you can extract a conversion. So all conditions actually depend on potentials, temperature, pressure, and the chemical potential for the elements. And that means you obtain a linear system of equations, which is much easier to solve the algorithm directly to handle it. But you need to calculate the second derivatives, which can be a bit cumbersome in, the, in some models. But um, we published a paper last year where we tried to explain how, how this open calfad works in, in um, calculating equilibria and, and phase diagrams. And this is the kind of figure where you try to explain um, what happens. So you have to specify conditions for your system. You have to guess a set of init initial set of stable phases and their compositions. And there is a special, uh, in open Calfa, there is a grid minimizer which obtains this. And that gives you an estimation for the amount of phases, their compositions and the chemical potentials. Then one has this equation Lagrangian multiply where you calculate all the partial derivatives. You have a linear system you solve and then you update the composition of all phases. And if an uh, unstable phase wants to become stable or a stable phase will like to disappear, you first check if you are doing a, a diagram, a step or map calculation. If you're not doing that, it means you update the set of stable phases and, and then you continue calculating here. If you're not doing a diagram, just a single equilibrium calculation, you check if your chemical potentials in the change between two iterations are smaller than a given value. If they are smaller than this value, you have calculated. If they are larger, you make a new iteration and, and loop in this case. And if you have a maximum number of iterations and have been converged, then the calculations are solved. So this is the basic algorithm for, for the equilibrium calculation. 
if you have a step or map calculation, one go to a second algorithm here. And there are two basically diagrams you make. One, one is the fa face diagram and one what we call property diagram. In the property diagram, you have just one axis and you calculate how the system varies with that diagram. Uh, and the commands in OpenCalfa to do a property diagram is a step calculation. And if you want to do a face diagram, you do a map calculation. And the typical feature of a face diagram is it, that it consists of lines separating domains with different sets of stable faces. So it means there is at least one face which has zero amount along each line in the face diagram. And this, well, John Morrell called them zero face fraction lines. So that's a term we have used in, in the explanation of this. So this is the beginning of a calculation of a diagram. You again have to set conditions. You make an equilibrium calculation. Uh, if that converged, you, have, you can set either one axis for a step calculation or two axis for a phase diagram. And if you want to have two axis, you have to find the zero phase fraction line. So the, the it, it program will iterate here until it finds a phase change. And then it will follow that phase change. So the during the mapping or stepping, it actually creates node points where two lines meet. And in the initial one, you have only exits. There is no line arriving at this node. But then in both cases, you will use the same algorithm to calculate both the property diagram and the phase diagram. And that is the algorithm. C1. And I show you some figures of a step calculation. This is for a high speed steel where you have a liquid at high temperature, liquid, and you have a small region with BCC phase form and so on. This is from the same calculation. You plot the heat capacity, and this includes the heat, uh, latent heat for the phase transformations. Also. This is a special type of calculation when you plot that just the Gibbs energy curves. This is not equilibrium at all. They, they are just uh, you typically use this a lot when you do assessments, when you want to discuss, understand how the different phases behave. This is another step calculation for a high alloyed chromium steel. So this is the way you calculate diagrams you have you come here from having a node point you search uh, for a node point with a un with an exit which is open and then you make a small increment of your axis each node point has an axis which defines the direction you should walk well not the direction actually because you can align you has two directions so if if you are a node point and want to exit and you come back exactly to the node point, that means you are, are in a forbidden way. And then you will in uh, Professor, I think you your mute. Your your microphone is mute. Sorry. <laughs> when did I do that? <laughs> just now? No, just 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 one uh, few seconds. But yes, just just ten, ten seconds. Yes, it's okay. okay. So you have back on the figure here. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit uh, dangerous part. Okay. So well, I will not explain in all in detail here because you can read it in the paper. And, and um, but uh, basically, when you have calculated an equilibrium and it doesn't, there is no error. Then you check if you are at the axis limit. If you are at the limit you have set for an axis, you have terminated the line. You go back and search for another node point with a free exit. And, and then, if there are no free exits, it means you have finished the diagram. If you're not at the axis limit, you check if you have a phase change. 
And if you have a phase change, we have another algorithm. If not, you save the results from the calculation and then you check which uh, axis actually has the largest variation. Because if you have a mapping, uh, you can take ax one axis may change much quicker than the other one, and, and you true try to sh you should mo move in the direct axis which has the largest increment to avoid that you get big two big steps in the diagram. And otherwise, you just continue here. And whenever you have a phase change. Um, you go to this algorithm here, and when that algorithm has finished, you go back and search for node points. Here you can create new node points, and because the line will change. And here are some diagrams. These are typically binary diagrams, uh, iron, molybdenum, manganese, copper, magnesium, copper, uranium, oxygen. Uh, this is iron, carbon, both the stable diagram and the metastable one with cementite. A ternary diagram, <coughs> iron, chromium, nickel. And the nice thing, one nice thing with well, thermocalc and open calfade, you, you can calculate a diagram like this and then you can plot it like this. Uh, you can choose. <laughs> and here you have an activity rather than the composition. Uh, and the sigma phase here is uh, the one you have in the middle here. And the two phase regions becomes a line because you have the semi same chemical potentials uh, in the two phase regions here. And here you can see the meaning of the node point. This is, if you start the calculation here, you will find the sigma phase, and that is a node point here. And then you will have two exits from this node point. And when you come here, you will again create two node points, and then you will finish at the axis limit. And then you will take a node point and then come here. And here you find that uh, the node point has already been found. So you just take away an exit. So you don't go around forever in, in this circle here. This is an uh, iron aluminium system with. Uh, this is a second order transition, which is a bit complicated sometimes to calculate, but the way open calfard works, you can set as a condition that the difference in, I mean, this, this is a ordered BCC phase. And the difference here is that here you have different compositions on the two sublattices. Here you have the same composition on the two sublattices. But open calfard, you can set that you should follow a line where the difference is a minimum value. So you can calculate second order transitions like this. This is another way also to plot uh, the iron uh, carbon diagram. Instead of having temperature, you can put, put plot the enthalpy. So these are the same calculation for the metastable phase diagram. And you have the enthalpy triangle here for the liquid FCC and the cementite phase. This is also related. So this is an isoplet calculation. I know people don't like isoplet calculations because Traditionally, these were drawn by hand, and then you had very little information. You don't, in the two-phase region here, you don't really know the amounts of the phases. But when you calculate this one, you can get all the information from the calculation. It doesn't matter if it's uh, inside or on the line. This is also a phase diagram for multi-component uh, high-speed steel. So you have different carbides forming at different temperatures and you have invariance. And here it's, use, it's useful to combine a phase diagram with the step calculation. Here I have the same material, but I have fixed the carbon content and varied the temperature. So one can see how the amount of phases changes with the temperature. So this is a kind of overall impression and then you can ex select more detail what, where you want to do more calculations to obtain more exact information. So how does the algorithm work when you fix change phases? Because uh, this up. When you have a phase change, sorry, <laughs> it's too touchy. Um, you change your conditions. You set that a new phase should be fixed and release the remaining axis condition, and you calculate the equilibrium. If that doesn't work, you go back and, and 
give up this line. Then you have a check again that this, is, that this equilibrium is actually a global equilibrium, that it's not, uh, you haven't walked into a miscibility gap or something like that. And then uh, if, you, if you have done that, you delete the line you, because it goes into a metastable region. Otherwise, if it's not uh, global, if it is a global equilibrium, then, then the line is terminated and you should create new lines starting from the node point. So you first check if you already have found this node from another way, as like I said for the sigma phase in the iron chromium nickel. If you find the node is already exists, you mark an exit in this uh, node point from done and finish. If it is a new node, you create you create the node. And if it's a step calculation, you just follow a line, you create just one more exit in the same line. If you have tie lines in the line, in this plane, that means a normal binary diagram and ternary isoplet, then all node points has two exits. So, because you have, as I showed here, in this diagram, you, a node point here always have three lines meeting. And you, so when you come to this point, you have two exits. If it's an, uh, if it's don't have tie lines in the plane, you have to check if the equilibrium is an invariant one. And if it's invariant, you have to another uh, algorithm to determine the number of exits. Otherwise, all invariant tie lines will have four, three exits. So then you go back to algorithm C1, and uh, in C1 you look for ex exits which are, have not been finished. So that's the basic algorithm there. The isoplet is a bit, uh, I will not go into here because I have made a figure for it. <laughs> so this is a case study where you look for a ternary iron chromium carbon system with a certain fixed amount of chromium. So this is an isoplet calculation. This is a single FCC region. This is a single liquid, single BCC region. The rest of the lines here, uh, the phase stable here is not in equilibrium with the phase on the other side here because the composition of the chromium is different in the FCC and the BCC. But they have the same carb, well, and they have different carbon content also. But the so the, here we have an invariant in this system, and this is a magnification of that invariant. And you can see I have marked out which phases are stable in the different regions here. And to find out which exits you have in the plane of the diagram, one can make a figure like this one, because these are the four phases which are stable at the invariance. And this dashed line means the plane of the calculation that can be, I mean, this was for 13% chromium. If you had 15 or, or other fraction, you will have different lines here, but the crossing of this line with the uh, combination of two sets of faces here are determine the exits you have. So here we have four exits and at each exit you have two lines meeting. So the algorithm uh, here determines where you have the correct mass balance for your for your isothermals, uh, for your isoplet calculation. And those are the prescribed con compositions of the in the your isoplet. Okay. So the general structure of open calfad, you have a start the program. I don't like graphical user interfaces, so I have a one line use interface where you type what you want to do. You can prepare all the commands on a macro file and run it directly. Then uh, the commands allow you to make calculation, a single equilibrium calculation, or you can do a step or map calculation. And then the, I use a free software called GNIPLOT for, for the graphics. There is also a beginning of an assessment module where you can actually add experimental data, DFT data theory, in order to obtain mo model parameters. 
And there is also a software interface where you can go directly to the equilibrium calculation. Well, you have to set conditions and so on, but it's, it's not interactive. That's up to you to write your application software. And then um, the equilibrium calculation, all this using Lagrange multiplier, solving uh, uh, this system of linear equations and so on. And in the basic here, we have a database where you have all the dynamical models, uh, the parameters you need for your calculation. So assessments is a key part of computational dynamics. You need to be able to find a database which covers the system you're interested in. There's quite a lot of bad databases around. And the commercial companies providing software and databases, they are usually better, but of course you have to pay for them. So it's uh, sometimes you need to try to find something cheaper. And I wanted to show you some uh, useful direct calculation and I chosen a steel. So this is uh, where you can have um, this uh, tensile testing where you have a soft anneal material where you have large nodular of uh, cementite, so this is easy to form, and then you can harden it in different ways, martensite or bainite or whatever, perlite. And uh, this is quite unique for, for steels, actually. So I took a diagram, iron, manganese, carbon. This is a stable phase diagram. Um, Actually, I should have suspended the graphite when I did this, because graphite you will never find in a steel. Uh, graphite has a mo molar volume, which is much larger than the other phases here, so you create a lot of stress in order to obtain graphite. But this is actually the stable diagram. And as uh, Harry Badisha showed, uh, we can have lots of other transformations than the equilibrium ones. And one of these types is called the para-equilibrium diagram. And the, in the para-equilibrium diagram, you assume that the manganese does not redistribute between the FCC and BCC. So the, when you cool down the FCC, your, bain, your BCC phase here will inherit the same manganese content as you had in the original FCC phase but you will have a chemical potential of carbon the same. And that gives you a diagram like this. So you have, uh, well, at present you don't see the difference in, but here you have tie lines in this, it's basically a binary system, as assuming that manganese behaves like iron. Then uh, Harry Badisha talked about the T0 line, and you can easily calculate uh, where you have the T0 line, where you were the same Gibbs energy for FCC and BCC with the same carbon and manganese content. And this uh, determines quite a lot of, of the possible transformations which are non-equilibrium in the system. And then I put it all together. So you can see the stable diagram is, is the one with, uh, you have uh, this line, the para equilibrium line is of course inside the two phase region because it's metastable. So if you cool down FCC into the uh, power equilibrium line here, you can have a very rapid uh, diffusion of carbon away from the FCC and forming uh, BCC with a different composition here. And if you cool it down below the T0 line, you can have martensite or other forms of, of uh, carbide structures. So having this information, you can calculate lots of possible metastable transformation. And the fact is, this is because in the Calfat technique, you, you obtain descriptions also of the metastable states. But I started with the metastable states of chromium, FCC, chromium and BCC nickel. And those properties are important for, for these types of calculations. 
then one can also do this kind of child Gulliver solidification diagrams. This uh, well, it's a bit uh, cryptic here, but uh, the stable solidification. You would have the first solid formed here, which is the aluminium phase. Then basically until here, you will have just aluminium dendrites forming, and then you will get the MG, MG2SI, and then the zinc will uh, solidify. So equilibrium, you will only, you also will be solidified at this temperature. But if you assume, according to the Charles Gulliver, that uh, the, leak, the solid phase there is no solid phase uh, redistribution, so the, no diffusion in the solid phase. Then um, the initially solidified aluminium will have much lower alloy content than the liquid, and the liquid is assumed to be homogeneous, so you will have the total amount of, of liquid will go follow this curve, and this is the total amount of aluminium in, in your system. So you get liquid stable down to 200 degrees lower than in a equilibrium solidification. And this is the composition of the liquid during this child Gulliver simulation. And you can see that the final liquid, this is the fraction of zinc in the liquid phase. So you have almost 80% zinc in the last liquid formed here. So this is a segregation. You can simulate the segregation very well in, in by this method. And uh, well, then we have uh, this kind of um, application software interface where you want to simulate something more complicated. So you, this open CalFAD application software interface contains routines where you can read the database, set up uh, what kind of calculation you want to make. You calculate the equilibrium, you take a step in time, and you calculate uh, the kinetic, what is happening in the system, that the diffusion generates new composition in all the grid points in your simulation. And if the change in the or composition in the, all the grid points is uh, zero, then you have reach the equilibrium state for the whole material. Otherwise, you can do a new calculation and obtain new equilibria in all the grid points, and that gives you chemical potential, and the chemical potential will drive your diffusion, and you take a new time step, and you go on like this until you have, well, the number of time steps you are interested in. So, well, you can do quite a lot of thermodynamics, not just steam engines. And uh, you are welcome to have a copy of this lecture, and I added the re relevant references for what I have talked about. Um, there is a book I wrote, well, it's quite some years now, which gives you a general introduction to the Calford method. Um, these are the website where you can find uh, Open Calfad. This is a pre-compiled uh, Linux version, uh, Windows version. This is the currently recent version which you have to compile yourself. Uh, you need a Fortran compiler because uh, I prefer Fortran to that. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> this algorithm I showed. They are, these are published here last year. And there are some cases where the sim open calfad has been used for kinetic simulations. By, uh, this is in an aluminium alloy. This is in a nuclear case. I, I collaborate with the nuclear industry in France. And this is describes this uh, EEC extrapolation method. This is about molecular stabilities. Um, they have been questioned many times, but basically the first principle people now agree that uh, Larry Kaufman was quite well. And these are our papers on, on uh, this is one of my, my <laughs> old assessment cases for the aluminium iron system for the DO, including the DO3 ordering. 
So that's all. Thank you. From what I get, you know, I'm just an engineer, but uh, I think that uh, your position is very important because you try to to make because you have some information from the community of uh, would say physicists that uh, they are working uh, from ab initio techniques, so they can do a lot of very complex calculations, but they are very good for zero Kelvin, and then then there is a lot of work to do from zero Kelvin up to to. 273 uh, degrees. Uh, uh, the the first for, for what I get from my my simple and naive uh, idea that uh, working with the uh, Larry Kaufman's and that then your own uh, thermocal program and then you you could have everything starting from uh, let's say room temperature and above. But if you want to have something more from from theoretical people, you should try to to make a sort of balance. And this is very complex, I think. Well, uh, the, the way we are re-evaluating the unit is now we will obey that the heat capacity should be zero at zero Kelvin. <laughs> we haven't agreed if the entropy should be zero at zero Kelvin, not for the metastable uh, states at least. For the stable states, yes, but not for the metastable ones. And then uh, there are a number of uh, magnetic and other transitions in some of the elements, which is a bit complicated, but uh, well, it takes time. Um, and the problem is if you have a new, completely new unary, you have to reassess all the binaries and ternaries with that day, new element. So that's a bit complicated. Must be terribly complicated, but uh, as long as for the moment everything works for, let's say, from a community of uh, metallurgists and engineers, uh, the, the situation is working with uh, the current databases. For me, an open uh, software like OpenCalfa is very promising because you can work on, um, on everything. I mean, you can have a, an idea of what uh, databases are really telling you, and maybe you can have some idea. So nothing against commercial programs, that they have very nice interfaces, a lot of people working on that. But I think uh, we do need uh, someone like you have done to provide uh, an open software to work on open databases to try to, to, work, uh, to work out and understand what's going on. So, for me, I'm very interested. Unfortunately, I'm not as good like you in programming and, and doing things and also in, uh, let's say, in thermodynamics, as you mentioned. So so I think uh, I think it is worth in any case uh, to, to, to consider and to uh, this morning I have installed your, your software with you in, in, in a few minutes. So I think it is quite easy to install and, and maybe it's a little bit more complex to run, but I think for installing it's OK. Well, uh, installing it shouldn't be a big problem if you're yeah. running on Windows. On Linux, yeah. you have to compile it uh, with the compiler you have, but mm -hmm. Linux is always like that. Mm -hmm. The problem I haven't, um, well, it's maybe a bit difficult for the beginners because you know, the diagrams doesn't always complete, not complete by one start mm -hmm. point. One may have to have several start points to get a di mm -hmm. complete diagram. And, but mm -hmm. That will come by time, but uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, apart from me, uh, but because me and Bo, we can meet for a beer in a, in a quarter yes. of an hour. But. That's really nice.